broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started in about a minute or so. Okay, welcome everyone. Let's get started. Uh, if more join, that's great. But um, uh, thanks for taking time out of your busy day. This is uh, Fortune Management and Wheel Media's presentation of a Practice Recovery Acceleration Plan. Uh, my name is Phil Bride, and Ian McNichol is here as well. Go ahead and say hello, Ian. Hello, everyone. Morning or afternoon, I guess. Good afternoon, yeah, by one minute. So this uh, this was developed uh, working nationwide with uh, hundreds of dental practices and dozens of executive coaches, key industry leaders like Ian, and big dental supply companies, others, and a crack team of experts, including dentists, hygienists, and some of the best in the field. So we're asking practices how they can make this the best year ever and dental offices are actually stepping up and i wanted to share we wanted to share with you some of the best practices we've come up uh, we've developed over this so let's dive into it um, by now you should have all eight of these lines of uh, defense these defensive moves in place if you're not a fortune practice Hopefully your CPA helped you get these in these defensive moves in place. Things like temporary unemployment, that's kind of a no-brainer. Same with the PPP and the SBA loans, um, as well as contacting lenders for deferment of payments from mortgages to payments on buildings to equipment payments, all that stuff. Landlord um, rent and lease deferments interruption of business insurance, which if you haven't yet, please check your insurance to make sure you have it to see if you have that. A lot of people don't have it, but you might. And then um, if you're on payroll as a doctor, if you're on payroll yourself, you could get unemployment also. Lines of credit just as cash backup and then defer pay paying taxes, which hopefully we all know that. So these are the defensive moves that that should be in place by now. If they're not, it's not too late to get them in place. Please do that as quickly as possible. Um, but this is not about defensive moves. This presentation is really about offensive moves, how to move forward and get ready to make things happen for your practice. Uh, one of the big things, and this is kind of an interim between defensive and offensive, is to get a 90-day cash flow plan in place a 90 day looking forward cash flow plan. So the the cash flow outline really is is um, it's it's like all money management. Cash flow is a weekly and monthly activity. So if you have a CPA that's on top of business operational stuff, kind of like a CFO, that's awesome. If not, then that's becomes your job as CEO of your company to manage the cash flow. In many ways, it's similar to household finances. Um, <clears throat> with money coming in and money going out, and they fall into three categories, fixed, variable, and discretionary. Fixed is rent and utilities, insurance, advertising, loan payments, stuff like that. Variable, salaries, supplies, merchant fees, and then discretionary, things like meals, travel, equipment. 
And there's fixed variable and discretionary in both business and the personal side. And of course, you got to take care of both of those uh, for not just yourself, but also watch and make sure your team is aware of this too. And, and uh, to bring a team back and really develop a team, which is what we are big on, is having that team be the strength of the practice. So there's this concept called kinetic recovery. There's two major aspects of the analogy of a, a race car. You see the picture here, you've got a Formula One car. <clears throat> so first of all, it takes a lot of work uh, from a, 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 a physics point of view, a lot of work to get that car in motion and moving fast. It takes the same amount of work, energy, to bring it to a rest. And just like in a practice, there's a lot of energy to get your practice launched in the very first place and to get all the processes and people in place and things working well. And that energy dissipated when we shut down. Now it's going to take a lot of energy to get going again. And that energy has got to be proactive energy. There's a second aspect of this, and that is when a race car goes into a corner, it doesn't it slows down going into the corner and here's the difference inexperienced drivers keep going slow throughout the whole turn experienced race car drivers as soon as they start the turn they start accelerating hard and fast through the turn so they come out of the turn at full speed that turn is like the crisis that we're in now we decelerate fast uh, as we go, get into it and get the defensive moves in place, then we start accelerating with offensive moves as we come out. Big, that's, that analogy works so well for this. Now's the time to accelerate. Don't wait for the red the flag from the governor, governor to say, yes, we can start now. We've got the defensive moves over, the defensive posturing is done. It's time to get execution going and process really well defined for the new reality we're going into that require for the execution that requires special teams and the process is all about offensive formation every office will have a variation of this process and the point is to accelerate now don't wait um, when the okay goes that's like the green light going in a race and it's like you better be primed ready to go and boom off the starting line so there's an important concept that we at Fortune uh, really pay attention to, and that is state management, what our beliefs are. Beliefs really form the basis of culture. Culture drives everything. And a good CEO, a good leader understands this and, and makes, because it's the glue that holds the whole thing together and makes it work or not work. So let's talk a moment about state management. Our beliefs drive these, our state of mind drives our state of mind, our patient's state of mind, our staff's state of mind, what, what we believe. That belief then leads to our actions, our behaviors, things we say, our decisions, the little decisions and the big decisions. And all that creates results. These results are things we want or things we don't want. And those results, then reinforce our beliefs and around and around we go in the cycle. If we're creating results we don't want, that reinforcement feeds beliefs of, of uh, you know, things are against us or not happening the way we want, which creates a state which causes the cycle. The way to break this is to start looking at the results you want and move backwards, reverse that cycle. Go, so there are the results, what are the actions, behaviors I'm doing, not others, but me, it always starts with me. What are the actions and behaviors, the decisions I'm making or lack of decisions? And then what's my state? And here's the big thing. This is where it all starts. It's, it's, there's a step between beliefs and state. If you insert this word focus, what we focus on on any one point in time will change our state, our actions, behaviors, the results, and start reinforcing positive beliefs. And then we continue a positive cycle through this. Honing the state management skills are essential, not just for survival, but for thriving in this and to helping the team, your teams 
thrive during this whole process. So leadership in a crisis. One of the big questions is, am I being a great leader? Not just a good leader, but a great leader in this crisis. Crises tend to bring out whatever somebody is, has a propensity for. It brings out the best and worst in us, in people, in everybody, our teams, our patients, ourselves, everybody. So the fact that you're in a leadership position makes this happen. And here's, here's what's really kind of sobering for leadership. Your team, your family, your patients, they're all watching to see whether you step up or step back. They're watching you. They watch leaders. They watch everybody who's in a leadership position to see what they're doing, what they're deciding. So answer these questions for yourself. Are you communicating clearly and calmly to your team? Are you staying connected with your people, your team, your patients? Can you do it virtually? Are you doing it over the phone, FaceTime, various other mechanisms that we have available now? Are you protecting your people's livelihood? Because the practice is yours, but not only yours, it's the whole staff's. It, they're relying on that for their livelihood going forward. Are you protecting that and making sure that it's going to come back stronger than before? Not just strong, but stronger than before. And are you reassuring your employees that things will get back and you are doing the right things to make sure that the practice will start up and start going in the new realities that we're facing. So all these things are, are funneling down onto you. The patient's expectations, practice, expectations, get the practice going again, the team, um, all kind of funneling in on you. And they're looking for you for leadership. They're watching your moves, lack of moves, whether you're being bounced around by this or actually taking actions. So during this time, there's seven fundamental leadership uh, uh, topics to really work on during off season. Communication, vision, agreements. Fourth is values. Fifth is goals and the seven steps of a goal process. The assessment of strengths and weaknesses and then delegation and source teams. Seven, seven fundamentals leadership uh, skills that need to be honed in yourself and in your team to really come out of this strong. So, <clears throat> so what are you doing through this time? What specifically are you doing through this time to pull this together? And, and how are you doing personally through this? How's your state management? Are you uh, spending a lot of time doing CE stuff, which is great? And are you developing the team and putting plans in place to go forward? All important stuff, and it's stuff that you, that you need to pay attention to. So game day is coming up in, in Washington. Last I heard, I think it's May 5th or 8th. I'm not sure. Not sure what uh, the governor's doing on that. In Oregon, it's June 15th. It's quite a bit longer. In uh, California, it's uh, May May 4th or, or 5th. I, uh, so it's early in May. So whatever date your, your game day is, pick your date and start planning towards it right now. Uh, your, your team, your patients, your family, you, I'll need a sense of certainty to pick your date. Hopefully you've picked that date all right, already. And uh, the day you, op it's the day you open for business, which means there's a lot of prep that has to happen ahead of time. If you're waiting to, for that day to start doing stuff, you don't start planning for big game day on the day of the game. You start planning the weeks ahead of time. Now's the time to start. So there's planning. There's execution and there's process that really has to happen. And around the planning, getting those goals in place, the priorities, and then execution around those priorities and goals, and then hone the process of that execution so that that process works well and is repeatable across many people through the teams that you assemble. Even if you have a small team of, of three or four, you can sub-team those into, into things uh, and areas of of focus for them. So just like in, in football, if there's any football fans out there, you might recognize this as, uh, as uh, play diagrams. 
Um, but it's very similar to a decision tree, a diagnosis decision tree as well. So on the right side and far left, all three of these are plays, and there's nine options for each play. A wide receiver on the right, if you focus on that, would run straight down the field, but he has nine ways he could cut and do various things. So it's very much like a decision tree or a diagnosis, yeah, diagnosis decision tree that you might work through. You know you're doing some kind of, uh, you know, you, you know you have a, a particular situation and there's all these variations on it. So just like in, in, in the clinical side, you have a certain playbook that you're going from and variations off it, same thing in business. You have to have those fundamental areas of business with the same aspect. There's a play with variations that you have to have down on it, like scheduling, like um, scheduling day of, the reactivation plan, collection of AR, um, how you deal with reactivating patients that you thought were active but turns out are not, get them back into recare, get them onto a perio program. So personal connection is really where it's all where it all comes down to personal connection with your patients and with your team through phones emails personal touches texts um, zoom calls go to webinar calls you name it we've got lots of tools to get this personal connection in place and each of these people each of your patients each of your staff members are centers of influence for the practice for you to let get the word out to promote or not say a word or say things that you wish they hadn't said to their friends family others they talk to and that's as we as the rumblings to get things rolling now start to build and open people are going to be talking more and more often about where to go where the right place to go is there's two types of team support there's the practical side, which we spend most of the time working on and paying attention to. And there's also the cultural side. Think of the cultural side as the glue that holds all the tactics together. The tactics are things that we do day in and day out in, in the practice or preparing for game day, for opening and for uh, when we get back to work. The cultural side are all the small actions, all the small attitudes, things we decide to do or not do. It's, it's uh, whether we're taking the extra step to make things happen or not. So I've got practices that I'm working with where we, we've been working on culture for the last three or four months in, in earnest working on culture. And I heard last week that some of the teams started to work independently uh, and start to plan out opening day. What are they doing to prepare for opening day? And they started to plan just amongst themselves. Other practices I've talked to, the teams have gotten together and said, hey, you know, this is, this is all no good. What are you doing to look for another job or go, go out and find something that might be a little more proactive? Or how are you, you know, all kind of defensive scarcity mode, reactive kinds of things. What we want is, people to get into the proactive side of things. And that's where culture plays the major role. Culture development is, doesn't happen by accident. It happens with, with ac absolute um, intention to make it happen. And, it, and it's, a, it's a process. It's a process like anything. It's one of those soft skills that is deemed as soft during good times. And during tough times, it's where where it breaks or makes practices. So building certainty with your team is absolutely, in uncertain time, is absolutely an incre incredibly important thing. Even in good times, people want certainty. They need to be reassured by you that the practice is going to be there. Now, I'm not talking about Pollyanna, everything is great, wishful thinking kinds of things. That's not credible. What I am talking about is the need for reality-based, optimistic reassurance. Reality-based, optimistic reassurance. Acknowledge the reality of the situation. Be optimistic. We're going to things are going to be uh, going to be going well for us. We're going to get on top of it. And reassurance that we we've got a plan in place. Here is the plan. Here are the steps we can take. It's a lot like going out in a boat. 
Do you have a fire extinguisher? And um, do you have personal flotation devices, life jackets? Well, of course you do. Do you plan to have a fire and to be dumped in the water? No. You plan to have a great day out on a boat, but you also have that backup in case of something, an emergency happening. Same thing. Commun let's talk a minute about communication skills. There are four basic styles from the, um, from the guys who study behavior science, the behavior science guys in psychology. So I love this guy. I know how to communicate. I do it all the time. I've done it all my life. It's just that no one listens and it's their fault. Yeah, that's how a lot of us think a lot of times. So there is an irritating thing about people. And here's the deal on irritating things about people. We are all different. Yes, it sounds like a stupid thing to say it out loud, but that's why people are irritated by others because we have different communication styles. We expect everyone to communicate in our style and communicate like us. Where as leaders, we have to recognize that there are different communication styles and we have to adapt and speak the language of the person we're talking to, like a patient during a treatment, um, when we're talking about a treatment plan with them, or, or a staff member who we're trying to get to develop and work at, on a project that we want to delegate to them. We need to understand their communication style so we can be effective. Here's the four basic communication styles. Top left, get to the point, get out. I'm moving on to the next thing, the high decisive, high driver type person. The next person is, hey, let's chit chat and relate, build a relationship. Yeah, we'll get to the point, maybe, maybe not, but let's have fun doing it and build this relationship. Bottom left, build a logical argument, then get to the point. How else could you do it? Bottom right, we need more data, more data, more data before I get to the point. How could you make a decision without the data? Four distinct styles, none are right, none are wrong. They're all just different styles that work well in different situations. And we have to leverage all those skills, all those talents and be able to work with them as business owners, as people working with patients, with teams, as leaders, we need to understand that and adapt and build our skill level and being able to work with them. So it really comes down to connecting with people. Communication has to be timely, has to be decisive, and has to be compassionate. Compassionate. This timely communication, the guys who study like Harvard, Harvard Business, uh, uh, a review and the Bain Consulting Group, Boston Consulting Group, they study managers at all levels and they come up with the same set of four or five issues that managers are low skilled at from, from small businesses all the way to Fortune 50 businesses. Managers are typically low skill at communication. That means they're at the beginner level of communication skills, very low level. And it takes work to develop a skill around communication. It takes understanding the different levels and the different styles of people you're communicating with. Communication is absolutely key. Speaking of communication, let's talk, let's uh, bring Ian in to talk about communicating to uh, patients, the market, and others. Ian, do I need to pass it back to you or do you have control? Um, let's see. I think I can just take control back. Yep. There we go. All right. Okay. You see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks, Phil. Um, so what we'll do for the second part of the webinar here is I'm going to go through kind of a marketing strategy for what we should be doing right now. And so I'll give you a brief background of myself and WEO Media. Um, what I'm going to really spend a little time though is what does a normal marketing program look like in normal times, you know, pre-coronavirus, and then spend most of the time really focusing on what can we be doing right now to help us with marketing both now and also when things reopen here before long. <clears throat> so briefly, my background, um, I'm one of the co-founders at WEO Media. If you're not familiar with WEO Media, it's a dental marketing agency. It's a national firm. We're based in Portland, Oregon, but we have we work with over 700 practices all over the country, pretty much all 50 states. Um, 
So we started the company. I started it with my two partners back in 2009. And since that time, we've really expanded it to um, be a pretty full service agency. And all we do is dentistry. Um, dentistry Today named me one of their top CE leaders and consultants the last two years. So I've appreciated that and um, published my first book last year as well on mastering practice growth. And there's a lot of information in that book on growing a dental practice. So I'm going to kind of distill a lot of my lessons learned over the last you know 11 years of dental marketing and try to give you some 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 tips and stuff we can do now uh, and, and really set us up for a strong presence when when uh, patients come back <clears throat> but also what we can do right now so in a traditional situation normal marketing would involve three areas you've got internal marketing which is really to generate patient referrals from your existing patients online marketing which is your website and SEO and social media and all that stuff and then direct consumer marketing, which could be like direct mailers and print ads and whatnot. And so in a normal time, the, the majority of what drives new patient flow is the internal marketing and online marketing, and sometimes supplemented with a little direct consumer. But this is kind of traditionally how it works. Now, there's an organization called the Academy of Dental CPAs. Some of you may or may not have heard of them, but they, they uh, does, it's a few dozen dental CPAs representing over 9,000 practices that they do accounting for. So they have a ton of information on uh, you know, data for, for practices that are successful. One of the things that they found uh, is the, the clients of theirs that were growing would spend between three to 5% of revenue on marketing. And so that's kind of in normal times. Right now, obviously it would be much less than that. And we'll talk about what you should be spending now versus not. But in normal times, that's kind of what it would look like. For general dentists, uh, we typically see acquisition costs between 100 and $150 per patient. And so if you're spending money on marketing, that's kind of the target range I would be shooting for um, if you're tracking all, all where your patients come from. And we can talk about that in a little more detail. But what I want to talk about is now. So that's kind of in an ideal situation. You've kind of got the, those three areas of marketing flowing. Right now, things are obviously very different. These are pretty unprecedented times. Now, we are getting close uh, in the Northwest here to reopening in the next month or two. And across the country, you know, I was just on a webinar earlier today. And I had doctors from all over the country on the webinar, and uh, they're they're opening up at all different times. They just got off the phone with some with some doctors down in Texas, and they're getting ready to open up like in the next week or two. So it's really all over the board uh, what we can do. But let's first focus on I'll go I'll go through briefly internal marketing and direct consumer marketing, and then we'll talk mostly about online marketing, what you can be doing now. So with internal marketing, you know, obviously if you're not seeing patients right now, then there's not a lot you can be doing to generate referrals. But what I would consider or recommend right now is think about when patients do come back, make it a big deal. You know, think about what can I do to really make this an experience? Because if you think about what drives referrals from patients, it's not that you gave them a $5, $10 Starbucks gift card, right? It's really that they had a good experience, whether it was <clears throat> a good clinical outcome, friendly staff, good rapport with the doctor, or maybe you did something fun, creative, goofy, whatever. People talk about experiences. And so think about what kind of fun experiences can you do? Maybe you've got balloons. Maybe you've got some giveaways for kids. Maybe you're doing something kind of goofy with like a photo booth. I, I don't know, right? Just think of something that's fun, that's unusual, out of your norm, that you can kind of welcome people back and make it a big deal. That will get people talking. That kind of thing will generate referrals and buzz. Um, direct consumer marketing. So normally, this would involve mailers, print ads, these, these types of things right now. For the most part, I don't think it makes sense to be doing any of this. Just most people probably have already stopped these things. Um, with the caveat that there are a few things that I think I'll talk towards the end of the webinar where actually some, some, some mailers could make sense uh, in a specific situation. But I want to mostly talk about online marketing. So some things make sense to turn off, but other things are really important to keep on. And when we talk about online marketing, really what I talk, what I teach my staff. And what I teach at my lectures and what I wrote about in the book is the six pillars. So the six pillars of online marketing, you've got the websites, that foundational base, SEO, that's search engine optimization. That's really a, a bunch of things that you would do to get your site to rank high on a Google search result. And then pay-per-click ads, these are paid ads or paid traffic to get to the website. Um, fourth is online reputation and reviews, social media and video. So these are kind of the six things and why it's important to have all six of these going is most patients, when they're looking for a doctor in normal times, they're going to look at three to five pieces of information before they pick up the phone and decide who to go see. So in normally marketing situations, 
we're going to want to have all checking all these boxes because if you've got a nice website but you know five or six google reviews that's just not going to cut it there's just way too many people that have nice websites and good social media and good reviews it's just too competitive to have really chinks in your armor so that's kind of how it looks like in normal times so now what i want to go through i'm going to go through each one of these six pillars in more detail and talk about what specifically can we doing right now so first pillar is the website so right now it's really critical to keep your website active and live um, sometimes we've had a few clients kind of contact us and inquire about maybe should i turn off my website and we tell them "Ooh, that would be a really bad idea and here's why um, when google analyzes your website right what it does is something called indexing <clears throat> so about every 30 days google indexes your website which means what it does is it looks at all your website content and code and pages and blogs and everything and it stores all of that and then it comes back 30 days later and looks at it again and compares have you added any new blogs or any new content or new photos have you updated the code like any have you made any improvements right and you kind of get graded and over time your website develops what's called a domain authority and that's that's something that's built up over time it takes time to get that so as soon as you turn off your website google de-indexes your website and you lose all that domain authority it's just gone so whatever you've built up over the years, it's just gone. And so if you say, oh, I'm just going to turn off my website for a couple of months and turn it back on. Well, when you turn it back on, you're starting from scratch. You're, you're, you're throwing away all those years of, of SEO that you may have benefited from. So really strongly encourage people not to turn off the website. Keep it live. Now, also, you want to make sure that you, you've updated your site to have your current office hours. If you're seeing emergency patients, make a note of that. You know, make a banner going across the, the, the front of it saying, hey, we're we're seeing emergency patients call us between these hours or, or you know, if you have a live chat bot on there, that's another thing. Teledentistry, we'll talk about those things as well coming up here in a few minutes. But the main thing with the website, keep it updated and, and keep it on. Now, search engine optimization is an interesting topic. This actually, I think actually represents a pretty big opportunity for people right now. So for those of you on the webinar, this could be a big opportunity for you to take advantage of. So. SEO takes takes time, like the website I talked about, it takes time to build up your rankings. And so Google analyzes you like once a month, like I was talking about. And so over time, your rankings improve and Google looks at over 200 variables to determine how to rank your website. There's stuff on the website, it looks at, there's stuff off the website, it looks at, you know, like reviews and social media. And then on the website, it looks at code and content. And there's all this stuff and it takes, you know, a long time. Well, I, I, I like to think of things in terms of, of distance running. I'm a distance runner. I run lots of marathons and ultra marathons and stuff like that. And so I'll use this analogy because I think it's really a, a great analogy for what's happening right now with SEO. So let's say, you know, all of us on the webinar right now, we're all running on our marathon and we're all kind of in a pack all bunched together and we're all around mile 18 or 20 and we're starting to get tired. And all of a sudden, everyone around us starts walking or sitting down, taking a break. Meanwhile, we keep running and we're, we're separating ourselves from the pack pretty fast. When we're all kind of running together, we're running probably roughly the same speeds and we're really not getting a lot of separation. But as soon as people start sitting or walking, we get separation real quick. And so that's what's happening right now with SEO. The vast majority of practices out there are turning off their SEO because in, in, in an effort to conserve cash, which totally makes sense. I think normally you want to conserve cash. That totally makes sense. The caveat, to, would, the exception in my mind would be if you can spend money now that's going to pay big dividends down the road, then I would I would encourage people to do that if you can swing it financially. Um, if not, then then don't. But um, but there's a big benefit to be had because when patients come back, you're going to want to be on page one because that's where the vast majority of, of patients come from is, is from that page one, even your existing patients. And I'll talk about a little bit towards the end why I think patient loyalty might not quite be as much as it was before. And I'll talk about why that might be in a little bit. But think about it that way because it does take time to build up those rankings. And so this is something that I'm telling my staff and, and our clients as well. There'll probably never be a better time to make rapid gains in Google rankings than in the next few months. And that's because most people are stopping. What's been going on for years is we're all running the marathon, we're all running about the same pace, and it just takes time to overtake people because they're running maybe a little slower than you, but it takes you a little while to beat them. Well, when they start walking and running, if you keep running, you're gonna pass them real quick. And that's what's gonna happen with Google rankings right now. So I really wanna encourage people, if you are currently doing SEO, like good SEO, like actual SEO with unique content and, and, all, and all that, keep doing it. 
Um, if you're not doing any SEO, then I'd encourage you maybe to consider starting doing because most people are stopping and this is what's gonna happen when they stop. So this is a case study from one of my current clients at Wea Media. And so um, this, what we're looking at on this graph here, the horizontal Y or the horizontal X axis is, is months. So 28 months of data. The vertical Y axis is phone calls. So we're looking at phone calls by month. And we, we track this as these are, these are marketing generated leads from the website. So before um, the, the previous website, they were getting about 20 to 30 calls a month from their previous website. And when they launched our website with, with us, um, we were doing search engine optimization right out of the gate. And you can see as their rankings improved, you can see the phone calls went up pretty dramatically, pretty fast. And after a little over a year, the doctor canceled the service and we asked them, well, why would you want to cancel? We're, we're generating all these, all these new patient leads. And they said, well, we're not really you know, seeing that, that the impact. And so when we went and analyzed it, and about 40% of his calls were going to voicemail. So if you're spending money to generate leads, but then you don't answer the phone, well, yeah, of course you're getting a bad return on investment because you're not taking advantage of the leads. And so we encouraged them, well, just, you know, maybe use a call center, maybe have your staff answer the phone better, you know, something. And he just decided it was just more hassle than it was worth. And he just turned off his SEO. That's the backstory, totally irrelevant for our call today. What is relevant for our, our webinar right now is this is what happens when you stop doing SEO, okay? So he, we had got him on ranked on page one, and within a couple of months, he had dropped, boom, right off of page one, two, and three. I actually checked a few months ago. He's not even on the first five pages now. And so he, he really dropped quick. And he's in the Portland area. Um, it's a you know, fairly competitive market. And so this is what happens when you stop doing it. So this, the, the, the flip side of this coin is also true. If everybody else is stopping and you keep going or start doing it, you could rise pretty quickly. So just I, want, I like to show this visual to people to just show the impact of doing versus not doing SEO and what it can do for your lead generation. So really think about that. Okay, the third pillar are paid ads. These are the pay-per-click ads. So when you do a Google search, the very, very top of the page are the paid ads. The top, top three or four positions are ads. Right below the ads, you've got the, the map, which is the organic map section. And then below the map, you've got the organic listings themselves, typically about 10 listings below the map. So what I'm talking about right now are just the paid ads. So in normal times, you know, people can run paid ads for just all your different services that you'd want to rank for and, and get traffic for, and that's fine. Right now, most of those types of campaigns probably don't make much sense. However, um, what we're recommending with a lot of our clients is reduce your PPC budget. Don't turn it off entirely, but reduce it and use those ads for emergency dentistry. If, if, if you are willing, assuming you're willing to do that. Um, I've talked to some doctors who say, you know, I, I, I don't want the risk. I think if a patient came in and got coronavirus, I'd get sued and I'd be in trouble. I'd be toast. And they're just really concerned about that. Most doctors I've talked to don't take that, that approach or mindset. They say, hey, I'm happy to see emergency patients. What can I do? And so we run ads like we're open seeing emergency patients or call us now. We're open for emergency patients, you know, things like that. So you run those ads, people will click on them. And then we drive them to the website and then I'll talk about it in a few minutes here with, with live chat and teledentistry, how you can really convert some of those leads. But this is something you can do right now if you're willing to see patients to actually generate some patient flow. Now, it's not that emergency patients, you know, and teledentistry is going to, you know, get you back to normal revenue levels. Of course, it's not. But at least it's a way to have some revenue coming in. You're maintaining relationship with patients, maybe developing relationship with new patients. And you're keeping people out of the hospital emergency room, which is a great public service. So all good stuff. The fourth pillar is online reputation. In dentistry, we talk about the big four, Google, Yelp, Facebook, and Health Grades. Those are the most four most important review sites in dentistry. And so you wanna have reviews on those. Now, right now, if you're not seeing patients, of course, you can't really generate reviews. Um, one thing I would recommend though, is go to your review sites and make sure that the office hours and information are updated because not everybody comes to your website. Sometimes they type in your name, they see your Google My Business listing, and they just go right to there and don't even go to your website. So Make sure that all four of these profiles are updated if you've got them active online, um, just in case people go to, go to there instead of your website. Uh, one, one additional quick item I wanna mention here. A couple of weeks ago, Google came out with an announcement and um, they said, because of the current situation, we're going to suspend the posting of new Google reviews. And their, their thinking was right now, everybody's, you know, there's a heightened sense of, of you know, kind of freak out in the country. 
um, combined with most businesses are, you know, have a lot of furloughed employees. They're running on skeleton crews. And so their level of response time and support is not going to be what it normally is. So that combination just seems like a tinderbox to create a whole bunch of bad reviews online. That was Google's thinking anyways. True or not, I don't know. Um, so what they said is for the foreseeable future, we're not going to show new Google reviews on, on people's business pages. Not just dentistry, of course. This is just all business pages. And so I don't know if um, what's going to happen when they turn that back on. Um, I'm assuming that those reviews will be shown or maybe they're going to filter out the negative ones. I, I really have no idea what they're going to do. But at least right now, just know that if you are seeing emergency patients and they go to write you a Google review, it may not show up, probably won't show up. So what you might want to do is if you are having asking patients to write you reviews right now, I'd point them towards Facebook or Health Grades or Yelp, something like that, because those will probably show up. Okay, the fifth, the fifth pillar here is social media. Not surprisingly, people are spending a lot of time right now on their social, on their digital devices, right? Their phones in particular. And so take advantage of that, that opportunity to, to maintain connection with them. And I, you know what I'm recommending to our clients is, hey, just do a few posts, you know, one, two, three posts a week. Just get out your, your phone, do a little little video. You're like, you know, get on your, open your Facebook app, your Instagram app, and just take a little video. Hey, everybody, just out walking my dog. It's a beautiful, sunny day. Thinking of you guys, you know, hope you're staying safe. Can't wait to see you guys soon. We're going to be opening up the practice before long. Check back soon. You know, take care. Stay safe, guys. Bye. Boom. 15 seconds. You shoot a little video like that. You post it on your Facebook or Instagram page. It's free. It doesn't take much time. And if you're not familiar with how to do that type of thing, you can literally get on Google or YouTube and just type in, how do I post a video to my Facebook page or my Instagram page? And you can watch a couple of videos. And I, honestly, in 15, 20 minutes, you'll be doing it. It's, it's, not, it's not that tough. And this is a great time. You know, we're all on a webinar here today. It's a great time to continue to learn new stuff and, and hone our skills. So if you're not familiar with how to do some of this social media stuff, great time to learn. Just get on YouTube and you'll be an expert in no time. Um, the last thing I would say with social media is just, you know, keep it positive, keep it real, you know, just, just kind of light and fun, but, but just stay in contact. The main point right now is just, just to maintain some contact and some awareness. Um, last but not least, the sixth pillar is videos. Now in normal times, you know, we do professional video shoots and you put those on the website and it looks great right now. You know, it's, it's more about the selfies and, um, short little personal videos that you can post on your social media platforms. And so, Videos definitely increase engagement. So that's just something to remember. If you are bothering to post things, videos get much higher engagement than any kind of posts that don't have videos. Now, it's not just about the six pillars. There are other things that matter as well. Um, for example, live chat and teledentistry. So we have a partner that we, we work with at WEO and it's a, it's a really cool, it's a 24 seven chat platform. They only work with dentists and they will on, when they, when they onboard one of our clients, when we do it together, they ask, you know, what hours are you seeing patients, emergency patients? When would you be available to do a teleconference or teledentistry if you want to? What insurances did you take? And so all these kinds of things, right? So they kind of have a feel for your practice. And then if you tell them, you know, Monday through Thursday, nine to one, I'm available for teledentistry and emergency dentistry or whatever. Then anytime somebody engages in a chat on your website, they'll text you an email and say, hey, doc, you've got an appointment opportunity here. And then you can call the patient right back or, or hop on the video, hop on the teledentistry platform and do a live video chat with them. It's all HIPAA secure as well. It's pretty slick. So our, our partner that we're working with, they've offered that say, hey, let's just give it to everybody for free for a couple of months at least. And then um, after that time period, hopefully people are back up and seeing patients if they want to keep the profile, li the service live, then they can pay for it once they have money coming in. But for at least the next couple of months, they're going to give it for free. So if you're thinking about this, this is something, I'll put my contact information up at the end. This is a cool thing that uh, you could take advantage of if you wanted to, it's free. Uh, now, another thing is the old school newsletter, email newsletter. Um, you know, again, because people are spending a lot of time on their devices right now, these things are working. We're seeing open rates, 25, 20, 25, up to 35% of e-newsletters are getting opened right now that are coming from our, our, our doctors to our clients. Because we have a newsletter service that we sell or we send out to a bunch of our clients. Um, for, for our clients on, on their behalf to go to their patients. And it's like 50 bucks a month, it's pretty cheap service. But this is definitely something that you can do yourself as well if you don't wanna pay a company to do it. There's a couple platforms I would highly recommend. One is called Constant, sorry, Constant Contact. You may have heard of them, Constant Contact. The other one is called MailChimp, Chimp as in chimpanzee, MailChimp. Those two platforms are, are inexpensive, they're really, really good. They're a great medium to email your patients. 
And you can email them. If you're going to do that, I would say, you know, once or twice a month and maybe a couple articles, maybe one article focuses on, um, you know, just something fun, some kind of fun news story, something encouraging, positive. And then the second article is really more around kind of just updates on you and the practice and how things are going. Um, and, and of course, when you when you feel like you've got a beat on when you're going to be reopening, definitely let everybody know about that. Right. Post that on your newsletter, your website, your social media, all over the place. I know the last thing I want to talk about in terms of marketing strategy and tactics here, and then we'll wrap it up with, with a little Q&A, safety messaging. So, you know, historically, how, how things have normally worked for all, and again, we've done marketing for over a thousand practices, so we have a really good sense for what patients respond to in marketing messaging. Normally, it's historically been, you know, uh, expertise, patient experience, do they take my insurance? Is it cost? What's the cost? Is it local proximity? Is it convenient? Th those types of things are are the main hot buttons that patients historically have, have responded to. There's a new one now, it's called safety, <laughs> right? And so now here's what's interesting about this. Doctors, you guys have been dealing with, you know, patients who, who are potentially infectious for years, AIDS patients, infectious diseases, like you already have this stuff in place, but the vast majority of the public has no idea what you guys do. And so in terms of, 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 of safety, so what I'm telling my clients is, Make a list of everything you can think of that you do for safety. Um, sterilization with your autoclave. What kind of PPE do you use? What's your protocols for using PPE? Um, do you have any kind of safety protocols? Do you have any kind of UV sterilization? Using any kind of HEPA air filters that, that filter out viruses? Like anything you can think of, just boom, make a huge list and then build a page on your website that just says like safety technology or our safety approach or something like that and just have a page on your website that just lists all the stuff that you do safety-wise, then have somewhere on the home page that mentions our practice is very focused on safety, click here to learn more, boom, and it takes them to that page you just built. And then once you've got that page built, you can link to that and feature it in your social media and your newsletters and stuff like that. And then also, now this is what I was referring to earlier, like I don't do direct mail or direct marketing except for this. If you, are, if you, if you build the safety page, and then you're considering, you know what, I would like to try to market for some new patients or to let patients know that I'm doing these types of things. Consider Google ads, Facebook ads, and even direct mail campaigns that talk about safety. And so it was interesting. I was giving this webinar literally yesterday to a group of doctors on the East Coast. And one of the doctors on the call on the, on the webinar said, you know what, that's funny, Ian. I just got a direct mail piece yesterday from an orthodontist around here. And the whole thing is just about her safety procedures that she's implemented. And I was like, yep, there you go. That's, it's the hot button, it's, it's the new hot button right now. So you, at a minimum, make a list of all your safety stuff that you're doing, put it on your website. That, like, honestly, that's just, everybody should do that. And then try to link to it, try to promote it. Because even if you're doing nothing new, like literally you're doing exactly what you've always been doing and that's fine, if that's, if that's what you're gonna do, cool. But patients don't know what you've been doing. They don't know about this stuff. I mean, most of the public had no idea what PPE stood for until a couple of months ago, right? Um, those of us who work in healthcare, I came from a manufacturing background when I was out of school, you know, 20 years ago. Um, I've, I, I used PPE back in the 90s. I mean, I've known what it is forever, but most of the public doesn't know this stuff. So just make a list and, and then you can promote it and link to it. So it's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity here to, to separate yourself. And really, when patients come back, they, they're probably going to be looking for people who are safety above, above other things. Okay, so let me recap what we talked about here and then um, and kick it over and Phil, we can kind of wrap up if there's any Q&A. So real quickly, um, website, right? Keep it up, keep it active and, and make sure it's updated with, with accurate information. Um, SEO, you know, keep it going if you're doing it and if you aren't doing it, I'd consider getting started on it. If you're not sure if the SEO that you're using is, is good, you know, you can have us take a look at it and we can analyze. If they're doing the code properly and the unique content and directories and all that. Social media. You know, post periodically, stay in touch, keep it fun, one to three times a week. Uh, consider the live chat and teledentistry platforms. There are several of them out there now. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, so I can't really say other than I'm familiar with our vendor we use. They're pretty solid, but I'm sure there are lots of good options as well. Um, consider Google PPC ads and as well as Facebook really to generate some traffic. And then the newsletter, right? Constant Contact, MailChimp, those are good options as well to stay in touch and be positive. So um, last thing I'll mention too, is if you want myself or one of my consultants more likely to 
analyze your current website and analysis and all this type of stuff. I can have one of my consultants, if you want us to, analyze this stuff. And if they do that, they can also send a, send you one of our books that we uh, that I wrote last week, last year. Or so, you know, so that's those are the the, the highlights I wanted to hit. Um, Phil, if you if you want to hop back on here with me, we can answer any any questions that might be from the group. Yeah, yeah. Can you pass back to me real quick? You bet. Um, Great. Should be coming Thanks. back your way there. Um, yeah, I think am I am I showing yet? Yeah, your 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 screen is showing. Okay, great. Um, one of the things, uh, let's see, one of the things that I wanted to hit on, uh, just to wrap up here for for us is, you know, this thing has been called a crisis, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's a crisis. So in Kanji, this is really interesting. Came across this. In kanji, the symbol shows both danger and opportunity. So in every crisis, there is danger, obviously, um, but there's also opportunity to rebuild, like Ian talked about, like we were talking about um, with the team. Um, <clears throat> with, with teledentistry and virtual hygiene, between the communication and getting your team organized around that, there's an opportunity to do stuff that will last beyond opening day and when you're back at it, because there will be people that'll be fearful even after we get back to it and in the second round that we keep hearing about. So that stuff is real and it's a re it's it's going to become a new reality for at least a portion of the patient base. And then with, uh, so with even though there's danger, there's opportunity and for some of our practices, we're talking to them and they're starting to realize that they could have the best year ever with some of the opportunities that are, that are coming out of this. Um, what I wanted to share is, as at Fortune Management, we've assembled a plan as far as how to relaunch practices. We've got our current practices deeply embedded into this plan where we're covering, you know, we covered the nine defensive strategies plus financial stability, the cash flow projections and analysis, um, for moving forward, the timing guidelines for both the PPP and relaunch, and uh, virtual teams, how to get those set up today and going, um, practice culture preservation and development now and after uh, reopening, and the team organization for execution. So we've got this going for our current practices, and what we're doing is we're opening this up for people that are not currently um, fortune practices and love to chat with you about it. And there is the possibility that you could make this a great year for you, your practice, your team, and your patients. And with that, um, here's our contact information again. And then if there's any questions, uh, you can throw them into chat or raise your hand in the uh, chat window and we can answer them. We'll stay on for a couple of minutes in case there's anything. Do you want to add anything else, uh, Ian, as we finish yeah. up here? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, we had a couple of questions and comments here pop up. Um, one was from Susan. She mentioned that the, I think Washington is May 19th. So thank you, Susan, for helping us with that. Um, a question just came in as well from Christopher. It says, um, what exactly is uh, virtual dental hygiene? Who would you recommend for teledentistry? Okay. So uh, for the teledentistry stuff, we're using uh, our partner company that we use is called Simplify. And um, we have a nice arrangement with them where they're letting our clients use it for, for free for two months. So um, that's, that's a good platform. I know there are others out there. I'm just not as familiar with some of the other ones out there. Um, I think RevenueWell, if you're using RevenueWell, I think they've come out with a platform. Um, I know there's- RevenueWell has some, and if I may interject, um, uh, Fred Joyle has a great video on Facebook and YouTube uh, walking through the, I think, the 12, uh, 12 steps of teledentistry. Fred Joyle on his Facebook page and YouTube channel, 12 mm -hmm. steps for teledentistry. And it's free. Just jump in and, and look at it. it um, and then simplify or, or revenue well and some of the things that Ian's talking about are fantastic. Yep. 
all good resources. Yeah, that that's right. I forgot about Fred had that thing too. So it's, thanks for the reminder. Um, okay, I think those are all of our questions for now. Um, I would, if I may, uh, uh, mention one thing. Along with teledentistry, um, there's also virtual hygiene that could get started and get your hygienist working today um, beyond emergency work. And it's a virtual hygiene. It's not, you know, it's not a way to make a lot of money, but it's a way to get the, the hygienists working and re-engaged with patients. And here's the belief is that virtual hygiene could play an active role in, in the in-between recare and perio appointments after you get back to speed, making sure that those patients didn't forget about their daily routines. And so there's a way to re-engage patients and, and build them up for, uh, keep them on track for their treatment plan, recare, and perio plans. That's good feedback, Phil. Okay, good. any other, uh, any yeah. other questions or thoughts? Yep, it looks like we got a couple of just quick comments here. Um, Another good point from Susan, not to mention the health link between good oral health and overall health. Absolutely, especially right now, right? <laughs> more important oh, than yeah. trying to stay healthy right now. So good point. Um, well, a couple more questions came in. Um, one here from Stephen. It says, how much would you recommend spending a month on PPC ads? That's interesting. So historically, PPC ads in dentistry, we can get clicks for five, seven, maybe ten dollars a click on the high end. Right now, what we've seen is the the um, the competition for these emergency dentistry ads are are going up quite a bit. So we're seeing you know 10, 15 bucks a click, sometimes more in some markets. So it really comes down to kind of conversion rate. What we're recommending for people is maybe start with a budget of like 500 bucks, maybe 750 for a month. Give it a shot and see how many patients that generates. I mean, if it's working, obviously you can ramp it up, and if it's not, you can just turn it off after a month. But that's Kind of the budget range we're starting people with so but i think i think that is um, i think those are all, all of our questions for today so appreciate everyone's time today thanks for joining yes thank you everyone for taking time out of your day um we'll be following up with a quick email just with uh, some some of the information as well yep sounds good Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Well, thanks, Ian. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thank you, Phil. Bye.